You're listening to the Visible Expert Podcast, where we share stories, research, and actionable insights to help B2B marketers and practitioners drive extraordinary growth in their professional lives. All right, thanks for joining us today on the Visible Expert Podcast. I'm John Tyerman. And I'm Kelly Waffle. And today's show, we have Mark Amtower of Federal News Radio as a guest, and uh, we sat down with our managing partner, Lee Fredrickson, and we had a conversation with Mark, and I thought it was really interesting to hear his background on um, marketing to the government, and I, I thought his story was really compelling. Yeah, and you know, I've known Mark for a while now, and you know, what you always get from Mark is a, a colorful and candid response, and he doesn't miss the mark in this interview either. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought some of the things that he talked about was pretty interesting. Obviously, he's really big on using LinkedIn, and um, he was one of the early adopters of that platform when it came out. I didn't realize that LinkedIn actually came out before Facebook. I thought that was interesting, something I learned. Yeah, all these things get mixed together. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the truth. Yeah, and then uh, his story was really interesting, too, about how um, you know, he, he gave up drinking, a challenge that he overcame, and then um, a lot of the live events that he does, and there was at one point where someone came up to him and said, Mark, you've made it. I thought that was a really interesting story. Yeah, I, I really do think it's interesting because, again, as people climb up through the ranks to become a higher and higher level of visible expert, uh, there are a lot of challenges that occur. And, you know, again, Mark is very open about that, uh, some of the struggles he has, but then also when he started getting validation that uh, people were listening to him and appreciated his thought leadership. Yeah. Well, let's not uh, delay any further. Let's go right to Mark. And as always, this podcast is brought to you by Hinge Marketing. Check us out at hingemarketing.com. And on that note, let's go right to Mark. Well, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here today. We've, uh, you know, we've been on uh, so many conversations together that this feels uh, very comfortable. And we want to dig in a little bit to your background as a visible expert. But uh, as we're getting cranking here, I want to start out with what's going on in, in your life, in your business. What are you up to these days? It's exciting. Uh, well, you know, I, I, uh, January 1, my business turned 35. So that's pretty cool. Started uh, as an infant, huh? I started, yeah, right. Uh, I wish. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, just like uh, just like my son, it took me a while to figure out what the heck I wanted to do, and major part was I didn't want to work for other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been been fortunate and able to make a living as Amtower and company. But over the last few years, you know, because we've had conversations on this, I've I've focused down into really three primary areas: uh, social selling via LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, building that subject matter expert, the visible expert platform for smaller companies and for individuals. Uh, so I actually have a coaching program for individuals. Um, and uh, tying in the content marketing with that, because all of these things are intertwined. Right, all fit together. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the and, you know, have the show, the show turned 13, uh, February. Right, and this is a show that, sin can you kind of lay out for us how uh, how it's distributed and where it oh, appears yeah, and so um, forth? Uh, well, it, it, you know, I don't know how it was distributed initially because I couldn't listen to it in Howard County because the AM <laughs> signal was so weak. <laughs> Wouldn't get there. <laughs> um, yeah, so you need a steel plate in your head and aimed in the right direction and you hear the voices. Um and then they take you away, um, but uh, yeah, the the I was I was invited to join Federal News Radio thirteen years ago to do a show focused on the government market. Uh, as you know, we're in these studios now, um, so they can find us. It's it's broadcast on federalnewsnetwork.com. dot uh, com. The show's Monday at noon. Uh, I don't think anybody goes out to lunch with the idea of listening to my show. <laughs> Um, not even me. <laughs> so, uh, so you can get it on Podcast One, you can get it on iTunes, or you can just download it 
from the station website. So this was almost the the podcast the old fashioned way is actual radio right. to start with. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's funny because nobody tells me they listen to my radio show. <laughs> they tell me they listen to the podcast. And I'm going, you know, the first couple of times I heard that, I'm going, what the heck? Yeah, yeah well, what was interesting, you know, I, I met you the old-fashioned way. I think very first time I met you was probably at a networking event mm-hmm. or uh, uh, something on federal contract. And, and John meets you through the new fashion way through podcasts. And LinkedIn and Twitter and all those <laughs> yeah. Yeah. new, yeah, new channels. If, if you're in the government market, I'm kind of hard to miss on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly. In, it's intentional. Mm-hmm. So if I annoy you, sorry, <laughs> but I ain't stopping. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, uh, one of the things we want to talk about is kind of your journey to become, you know, what we've labeled as a visible expert. That's a you know high visibility person who has some specific expertise. Some people call these influencers, uh, but uh, you know, where did it start? Where where did you start your journey well first of all let me point out i I really like the way you explain this and for anybody who's listening if you haven't read lee's uh study on building the visible expert platform uh boy (laughs) you're you're missing it um so i you know my journey started without conscious thought Mm -hmm. so uh i started my business in 85 by 1988, I had a couple of articles out in trade pubs, uh, not your traditional trade mm-hmm. pubs, because I was I was better known in the direct marketing community first. I was helping direct marketing companies get into the government market, mm-hmm. um, and in '91, I got my first speaking gig. Uh, which I thought I messed up, but apparently I didn't. Um, you know, eye contact. It's all relative. <laughs> right, yeah, eye contact helps in ERS and us, but apparently I imparted enough information that, uh, that I actually got business out of it, which was cool. Uh, lesson number one, you can get business from speaking engagements. But I also started the newsletter. So uh, the first incarnation of... Uh, of the Amtower report came out in 1991 and was hard copy and distributed by hand and snail mail until uh, probably 96 or so. Mm-hmm. And it got pretty expensive to send out via snail mail because there were 7,000 subscribers. <laughs> a lot of um, snails. <laughs> yeah, a lot of snails. But it wasn't weekly then, so mm-hmm. <laughs> which is really good. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I wanted to be good at what I did. I wanted feedback and the best way to get feedback is to increase your visibility and share information. Mm -hmm. So if the information you share is flawed, people get back to you much faster. Well, I wasn't sure because people weren't getting back to me, but apparently, you know, people kept a lot of this (laughs) stuff. So, um, so it was an intentional path to become a, a visible expert, a subject matter expert. Uh, I, I just started aggregating what I was seeing, writing about it, and when I did things that were successful with clients, I would either get dispensation to write about it during the process or I would write about it after the process. Okay. If they didn't want their names involved, I didn't involve their company. Um, but it, you know, it just kind kind of built up from there, and also in the uh, in the early '90s, I did uh, I produced a conference for three years called the Government Marketing Services Expo mm-hmm. and Conference. Uh, I took over the McLean Hilton for an entire day, all the meeting rooms, mm-hmm. all the ballrooms, and uh, produced this thing so the vendors could display their expertise to the contracting community. Mm -hmm. And I I knew I had done something right when Tom Hewitt, who was literally the the central figure in government contracting then in the contractor community, came up to me in the middle of the thing and said, you've arrived. I'm going, 
I have to wear. <laughs> where? where, where I, I, I thought I was did, already is here. That the, is that the way it felt? Um, it did after he said that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I did it so I would get more exposure for my business. Uh, I did it because a lot of the companies that were using outside services were using agencies that uh, had no clue about the government market. Mm. So, you know, you, you go to Bethesda and you hire the company that, that sold uh, Bob's Big Boy uh-huh. and Unisys. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. why, why, do, why do so many people make that mistake, do you think? Um, I, I would assume it's, it's because they are told by higher-ups this is the firm we use for corporate, so we're going to use this firm for this. I was actually <clears throat> detained once, a very short-term gig. You know Fred Diamond. Mm-hmm. Fred worked for Gary Newgard, who ran Compact Federal. And their corporate ad agency was in New York, Amirati and Paris, and they didn't have a clue about government. Mm-hmm. Fred didn't want to go up and educate them, so he asked Gary if he could send Mark. <laughs> Uh, and Gary said, sure. So I got to go up to New York and talk to Amirati and Purus for a day about the government market. Mm-hmm. And it was like talking to a pet rock. <laughs> um, you know, it's the brand. I'm going, no, no, it's not the brand in the government market. You know, There's got to be more than that here. Uh-huh. So, um, so, um, so, yeah, my, my, my journey is, it's been conscious the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, but driven primarily by LinkedIn. So, Mm -hmm. you know, my first book came out in 05, and it's got nothing on social media in it. Mm -hmm. And that that book was nine years in the making because it came from a conference that I was speaking at in 96. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the people in the audience said, you know, where's your book? And I'm going, what do you mean? They go, you gave more information in an hour than this entire conference is going to provide us. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, well, that's pretty damn neat. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'll write a book, right? Well, yeah, and, and, and I, I started, and it's funny because Dendy Young, I told early on that I was writing a book, and he got tired of hearing it, and he finally said, when am I going to see it? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, shit. <laughs> now, now I gotta actually finish it. <laughs> so, but I didn't write it; I recorded it. I see. So I, I'm a fan of Dragon, naturally mm-hmm. speaking, and I find it easy. And once you learn to work with it, if you if you've got a, uh, a 90 minute PowerPoint, mm-hmm. you've got a 40 or 50 page ebook. Mm. So if you record it, get somebody intelligent to edit it. Intelligent in two ways. They have to know the grammar side and all that stuff. Right. But they have to know the market, too. Because mm-hmm. you don't want people editing out important important phrases, yeah. acronyms, et cetera. So, um, so you know, I, and, and once LinkedIn hit, I, I've been a member of LinkedIn since 2004, February 11, 2004. But I didn't really study it and try to figure out how to use it for three years. So I was sitting there waiting for something to happen. Mm-hmm. And in early 07, I read Jason Alba's book, I'm on LinkedIn, Now What? Uh, mm-hmm. Which is a great title, because that's where everybody Everyone was. Everyone is. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I read David Meerman Scott's first edition of The New Rules of Marketing and PR, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which led to him being on my show about seven or eight times. Um but uh, David's book, combined with Jason's, showed me that not only was sharing information being democratized through the web, it gave me a platform, a B2B platform, to leverage for B2G. Mm-hmm. So, and, and the funny thing about David's book, the first two editions of the new rules didn't even mention LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So Interesting. It, it, it didn't fit his core audience, so... Didn't write about it. Mm. So, Mark, you're you're big on using LinkedIn, and if you had to if you had to give someone and as someone who's aspiring to become a B two G marketer, someone who's aspiring to tap into that space and leverage LinkedIn, what's what's the number one tip that you would give to someone who's trying to to, to first learn about LinkedIn? 
it's hard to narrow down a number one, but your personal narrative has to be at or near the top. So figuring out what your own story is. So uh, my, my summary on LinkedIn starts with a couple of questions, but it goes into, you know, I'm not young, I'm not svelte, I'm not pretty. Basically, I'm not a millennial, but I can kick ass on LinkedIn. So, um, you know, don't ask me about the other platforms because I don't play. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm peripherally on Facebook, and I use Twitter as a push mechanism. Mm-hmm. So, but on, on LinkedIn, you know, the, the best advice uh, is to have a profile that explains who you are, what you do, and your journey from point A to point B. You know, point A being where you started, point B where you are today, and what you want to where bring you want to, to the market. So if you're relatively new to the market, you want to grow, you want to get better, uh, you have to demonstrate that expertise. So, but like on all social platforms, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, things to avoid is uh, uh, fluff. And fluff can take a lot of different forms. You know, LinkedIn is not a place for cat videos, mm-hmm. okay? And there are a number of cat video-like instances on... I don't need to look at your damn boat, Yeah. Mm-hmm. okay? <clears throat> I don't care what you drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to know if you think and if you produce and if you add value to the market. So adding value is the, the, the whole point of being in a social network, not mm-hmm. me too, not... <clears throat> um, I, I got an A on my paper... Um, mm-hmm. you know, what was the paper about? Is it germane? You know, mm-hmm. did it bring good things to whoever you were writing it for? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's yeah. what I think is so unique about LinkedIn and it's so focused on the professional community. And it, it, you know, I see when people start posting about their, their cat videos and things that aren't really germane to the topic at hand, there's generally a, a community census that say, hey, this isn't Facebook, this isn't Instagram, right. let's keep it professional. Right. So yeah. I think that's one of the, the really good benefits of using it. Yeah, this morning uh, uh, I get Facebook announcements in my Gmail. Uh, somebody announced that uh, on Facebook that his dad had died. So that is a Facebook message, it's not a LinkedIn message. So um, mm-hmm. just a yeah. prime example. Uh, you know, my parents died too, but I'm not posting it. Mm-hmm. I'm not posting it anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, um, you know, the kind of what you share, you bring up an interesting point there. What what have you learned over the years about what to share, what not to share? And, you know, there's a, always a lot of questions about, well, are we giving away too much? How much do we give away? What, what's your philosophy on that, and where, where have you ended up? We're, we're parallel on that, um, you know, because your, your, uh, your visible expert book, I, I have, uh, I use it for my graduate class at GW. I recommend it to all my clients. I've written about it a couple of times. Uh, I, I think it's a, a great framework if you're willing to put into work to get there, mm-hmm. right? So, <clears throat> but that's why I started the coaching program. You, you can mm-hmm. lead a horse to water, but getting them to drink is something completely different. So I'm always pleased when I see one of my books on a CEO's bookshelf. Mm-hmm. But my first question is, did you ever read it? Did you read it? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, Wiley's happy if they bought the book. Mm-hmm. I'm happy if they read it. Uh-huh. So um, now I forgot the question. Well, uh, I think what we're kind of looking for is how much do you oh, share? Where, where do you go? Well, how yeah, much, but, yeah. I mean, how much do you guys share? I mean, you know, if your kimono gets any more open, you're going to be arrested. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I write a monthly column for Washington Technology. I have a weekly newsletter that goes out through my groups. I have the, the longer version that goes out to several hundred people, and I have the radio show. I, I share as much, you know, when you come on, we, we, we geek out about, you know, subject matter expert, visible right. expert status and content and anything else really associated with it. 
we share a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So I come down on the side of, uh, for a marketer, if you're not sharing, nobody's going to see the value of working with you. Right. So is there a secret sauce there? No, the secret sauce applies, you know, everybody's problem is different. So every client that walks in the door of Hinge or anybody who calls Amtower and company has a different problem. Mm -hmm. So how we address that problem with them and for them is what differentiates them and how we bring our value to the table. So you can give them the book, mm -hmm. but it may not be a perfect fit for them. So you meld their story into that subject matter. First of all, you verify that they are one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I know a lot of people who think they are subject matter experts, thought leader, visible experts, and they're dumber than rocks. Um, <laughs> Let, let's not let's not be speaking poorly of rocks. <laughs> that, that, okay. Uh, well, I don't I don't want to use excrement, but. Um, <laughs> But it fits. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, putting thought leader on your LinkedIn profile does not make you one. Okay. Mm -hmm. The market tells the market who the thought leaders are by asking publications for more of their stuff, putting them up at conferences, all of the, the visible activity. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um Sharing information, I think, is absolutely critical, um, number one, to, to develop that visible expert platform, but more importantly, to attract clients. Mm -hmm. They don't want to work with somebody that's not, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, How did, um, as you, you know, uh, you're talking about the, the journey and the market telling you that when you're an expert. Uh, share for us a little bit how that's changed. You know, what, what, what were the first indications you had and, and how have those indications kind of progressed? Well, the, the, the first indication was probably Hewitt's comment mm -hmm. in one of the conferences back in the early 90s. Um, where he said, you've arrived. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the second one was I, I self-published Government Marketing Best Practices. It sold 9,000 copies, mm -hmm. which is pretty good for a self-published book. Uh, if I sold 10,000, technically it would be a business bestseller because that's mm -hmm. the definition of a business bestseller. I should publish it once again and just give... <laughs> just to get over 10,000 then. Yeah, not going to happen would require some major rework at this point. Um, LinkedIn and, and uh, you know, landing there on 04, starting to use it in, in 07. There was a uh, contest that, that uh, Lori Ruff and Mike O'Neill, two true social media pioneers, ran in 2009 called Rock the World with Your Online Presence. And I didn't know either of them, but Lori called and said, we really want you to enter this contest. And I'm going, all right, why? Mm -hmm. She said, well, because we think your profile is really good. So uh, about 45 million people on LinkedIn at the time, mm -hmm. and they were looking for however they define the best profiles. When the results came in, I was number three out of 45 million. I don't think all 45 million were reviewed. But <laughs> uh, And naturally, I was pissed that I was third. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, you know, that that's a milestone. Mm -hmm. um, the year before that, B2B magazine, the only magazine that was written for B2B marketers uh, that I ever knew about, uh, named me one of the top 100 business marketers in the country. Um, so, you know, th those kind of milestones, that kind of recognition from your peers is, is extraordinary. So, um, so I, did, I did pat myself on my back. And um, as well you should have. Um, so, but, you know, uh, the radio show when I was asked, uh, Am Amtower Off Center was the first show specifically designed for 
the contracting community, and they asked me to come in because Federal News Radio prior to that was a station exclusively for federal employees, mm. information for that community. So if we listened to it, you and I, we'd die of boredom because mm -hmm. none of it was germane. Well, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, germane to the audience, right? Right. So one of the advertisers was uh, having lunch with Joel Oxley, who runs TOP and FED, um, and uh, said, you know, you need a show for contractors, you know, mm. and you need Amtower to do it. I like when that happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, perfect. Yeah. And, you know, uh, about a year after the, uh, the show started, I was talking to Nick Wakeman, and I had written, you know, one or two articles for him before, and he said, why don't you do a regular thing for me? Mm -hmm. So the column in Washington Technology started coming out monthly in uh, nine, mm -hmm. oh nine, something like that. So um, there, there's several milestones there that that certainly helped increase that visible side. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of it as being pervasive without being intrusive. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to read my stuff. You don't have to listen to my stuff. But you're going to trip over it everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. If uh, you're looking for it. How, how did you end up being focused on uh, government contracting? <laughs> what, 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 you know, how did that start? <laughs> I, I backed into it. In graduate school, I, uh, I was paying for it by being a telemarketer in the evening. So I'd be that guy who'd call you at dinner time to uh -huh. renew your magazines. Right, right. The I think I hung up on you. <laughs> the, the difference with the company that I work for, though, is they spent a lot of time training you, making you extremely polite, and not. it wasn't a pressure sale mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. They, You know, because pressure sales don't pay. Mm -hmm. So Sterner and Klein actually had magazines lining up to get them to do their renewals. Mm. So Jerry's biggest problem, Jerry Sterner's biggest problem, was hiring enough reps to do it. So uh, Architectural Digest, uh, Scientific American, you know, some really mm. high-end pubs right, right. Were, were using him. And I got pretty good at it. I set their one-day sales record once. Uh, uh, but it, to my knowledge, it stood. Um, and uh, so I, I, I was pretty good on the phone. After graduate school, I, uh, my degrees are in American literature. Uh, I tried teaching for a while and found that, that uh, uh, I, number one, I could only teach part-time mm -hmm. at a community college level because I only had a master's degree. Uh, and it didn't pay hardly at all. Mm -hmm. So I took the telemarketing and went to work for a company that sold management training and IT training to Fortune 100 and government. So that was kind of my introduction to the government market. I went over to Government Computer News <clears throat> and became their first circulation director. Uh, so I, I actually put together the, uh, the, the original subscriber list, basically identifying special interest groups within government mm -hmm. and asking them if I could include them on distribution list for the only publication at the time mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. focused on their needs. And they right. all said, sure, sure. So I knew where the bodies were buried. Sure. Okay. Um, and, and my last, and this is kind of funny because it was really short. I worked at an ad agency very briefly, um, and the, the place in Bethesda that sold burgers, right? And they were pitching what is now Unisys, what was back then Sperry. And I was invited to the meeting <clears throat> without being prepped. Uh -huh. um, and, and Mark has no filter mm -hmm. uh, or tact, but that's beside the point. So <clears throat> they're going through this spiel, and they're telling Sperry, well, you know, your audience is around eighteen to 20,000. Isn't that right, Mark? I'm going, no, nah, actually, it's about 893, and they're all in this kid, you know, invited to leave the meeting immediately uh, and, uh, and vacated the premises shortly thereafter. Um, even if they had prepped me, I, I would have said, don't invite me to the meeting because you're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you could mm-hmm. still build a great campaign around, you know, just under a thousand people. Um, but <clears throat> they they thought predicated on my work at, at Government Computer News that the audience was broader. Well, no, it wasn't. They only wanted to reach the influencers. Right. And it was one of those little right. niches that I had found building the GCN list. Right, right. So, right. so you sort of backed into it? I backed into it, and after that last gig, I, I just decided I no longer wanted to live down to other people's expectations. I'd rather live up to my own. Mm-hmm. So January one. Uh, 1985, three weeks after I quit drinking, uh, I started my company. And, and if I hadn't done the first thing, I wouldn't be successful. Wouldn't have done the the other, the <laughs> so don't often talk about that drinking thing. Uh, so, so, Mark, what, um, thinking about your journey um, backing into the government market, obviously there's you know, challenges associated with that and, you know, how restricted you are and, and what you can and what you can do in the contracting space. <coughs> what, what are some of the, the biggest challenges or the greatest lessons learned along the way that you'd like to share? Um, that it's all about the customer. Uh, I mean, you guys mm-hmm. know that. Um, understanding their pain points, understanding all of the places where you can gather information for free about the customer's uh, issues. <clears throat> um, you know, they, every agency has to file certain documents about how they want to spend their money, their OMB 300 and their OMB 53. Um, so if you're, if you're not reading those, you aren't understanding the customer. But there, there are some ethical restrictions on how you can market to them. So there's a dollar cap on gifts and gratuities, that sort of thing. They can't uh, technically accept free meals at conferences where other people are paying. Um, so, um, you know, I, I consider these minor nuances in the, in the major players, no. But, you know, we've seen instances where uh, companies that are less sophisticated in our market and their ad agencies or PR units are elsewhere and, and they... You know, they'll send out, you know, um, <clears throat> Digital Equipment Corporation sent out a $30 book to all of what were at the time IRMs, now they're called CIOs. Um, and a one of the people who received it was an inspector general who immediately contacted Digital and said, if you do not collect these, send out a, an apology letter within the next 30 days, we're going to kick you off all of our contracts. Oops. <laughs> um, so the ethical threshold was $25, which includes tax. The book was $29.95. Um, <clears throat> you know, just silly things like this. But there's, there's hundreds of examples. But if you go to OGE.gov, Office of Government Ethics, they spell out the rules. So it's not difficult to find them. It's not difficult to stay within the parameters. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuances in the government market. But, you know, people sending out stuff that's talking about, you know, the profitability of your company, eh, wrong message. You know, it's mission mm-hmm. fulfillment here. Mm-hmm. So uh, there, there, there are nuances that way. Uh, you know, in, in, I, I've morphed my business a couple of different times. In the 80s, I was the king of direct marketing to the government because of my work at GCN, and also because I went to mail rooms to see how mail was distributed, what actually got through the process and what actually got into the dumpster. So uh, I knew more about direct marketing to the government than anybody except perhaps those mail room managers, Mm -hmm. and they weren't talking. Mm -hmm. Um, But they did let me in. So... um, You know, direct mail was great through the mid-90s. You know, then Netscape comes along, does this email thing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, this crap. (laughs) Yeah, you know, my list business goes to heck. Uh, (laughs) And you had to reinvent yourself. I I reinvented myself. And then, you know, in the uh, early mid-2000s, mid-2000s really, you know, this, this whole social networking thing comes in. And, uh, you know, most people don't mm-hmm. know that LinkedIn is more than a year older than Facebook, mm-hmm. number one. 
um, didn't obviously get the attraction or the attention. Oh, right. But um, but it is. Uh, so I had to morph yet again. But you know the same same basic rules apply. Uh, you're providing information to people who need to make decisions about spending public money mm -hmm. and fulfilling their missions. So if you're doing that properly, you now have a whole bunch of new venues in which to do it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you know where your audience is and how they are uh, grazing for information, for lack of a better phrase, um, Everybody's information grazing habits are radically different. Millennials are absorbing information through mobile devices. Lee and I have these things in our houses called books, and they're on <laughs> walls. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that guy from 451 is going to come down, yeah, yeah, yeah down our house four, and yeah. burn it. Um, <laughs> That's a book reference, too. Um, <laughs> you have to read to find it. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have video, we have uh, blogs, we have video blogs, we have, uh, you know, newsletters out the wazoo, we have events. Uh, your, your twofold problem is there's so much stuff out there, people don't know what to do. So getting your stuff in front of the right people and getting them to actually read it is cool. So um, I get I get kudos mm -hmm. in, in a weird way. People announce on LinkedIn that they're retiring, you know, uh -huh. vacating the premises. And I say, yeah, hey, enjoy the next phase. And they'll write back and say, hey, I've been meaning to tell you, I've been reading your stuff for 30 years, and I really want to thank you for all. I'm going, well, where have you been? <laughs> 30 years. <laughs> you know, you've, uh, you're obviously someone who's made it. You know, you've made it as, as a, a visible expert. If you could turn around and, and give advice to the young Mark, who uh, before he'd made all the mistakes uh -oh. and taken the time <laughs> and, and so forth, what, what would your best advice be to him? Uh, the best advice probably would be don't drink the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. Once you start getting any sort of notoriety, do not think you're the coolest kid on the block. Mm -hmm. um, if I were gone tomorrow, there would not be a void in the market. Mm -hmm. um, somebody, you know, Maybe several people would, you know, fill in the, the information gap that might occur briefly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, enjoy your time. Here. And don't, don't not enjoy notoriety. Just don't focus on it. Don't let it impact who you are and what you bring to the market. If you keep adding value, that's the, the, the key. And make sure it is a value by getting <clears throat> feedback and asking for feedback. Mm -hmm. So um, don't drink, don't drink the Kool Aid, and keep adding value. Those, mm -hmm. those I think are the keys, and that that's why uh, I have. I mean, we overlap in in some instances for what we do for companies. Sure, you happen to do it in a more organized fashion than I do, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I have no problem uh, uh, sending people your hell. I've referred you business. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have no problem sending it because it's good stuff. This is value. I use this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I still do it with attribution. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I damn well don't want to be caught with my pants down saying, didn't I read that in Lee's book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, talk to us just a moment about the relationship with other experts. Uh, is that important? It's something that sometimes people are a little bit surprised at, that you'd want to have a good relationship with other experts. They think they view them as competitors or something. How, how do you view other folks? I've mentored most of my competitors. Um, so uh, if, if they're good at what they do and want to get good or stay good or get better, uh, I have no problems with them. You know, last year at the at the game conference, I got the Lifetime Achievement Award for government marketing, which was 
Congratulations. Yeah, well really earned. Pretty, pretty damn cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and again, peer recognition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my, my son immediately asked if it came with a check. <laughs> <laughs> like the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Travis, a million bucks. Um, the, the dead time. Um, <laughs> Re- reframe your well, question. Well, uh, I think kind of the question is around how should one be thinking about their relationship with other experts? I, I, why I come in to see you, why I invite you onto my show. Um, I'm a solopreneur, so I can brainstorm with my cats mm-hmm. um, or uh, read books and stuff online. When I get to sit down with other experts... In, in especially marketing experts or even peripherally, uh, you know, proposal experts, business development experts, experts mm-hmm. in sales, people like Fred Diamond. Um, you know, this, it, it makes creative juices flow. The power of two brains together is exponentially larger than one. Mm-hmm. If you add in three or four other people who are peers or relative peers, you're just going to, you know, uh, ha- have a blast mm-hmm. just sharing ideas. And anybody who uh, uh, thinks that all of this stuff is coming out of their own brain. So I'm on, I'm on a couple of different LinkedIn expert groups. Mm-hmm. And there's this one person in groups that keeps complaining that everybody's stealing their ideas. And I'm going, <laughs> you know... It's a finite platform, and if you look at it long enough, we're all going to come up with the same crap, and nobody's reading you anyway. Uh, <coughs> would you say your name was? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. it, the, the, you know, I had questions this morning about what do I do with, with this, that on LinkedIn. I aimed them at the, uh, it's now on uh, Facebook. It used to be on Google+, Plus, which is now dead. On Google+, Plus, it was called the LinkedIn Experts Group. Andy Foote started a group on Facebook to transfer everybody over, and it's like the LinkedIn Expert Action Hero Group. I'm going, oh, Action Hero, give me a break. <laughs> but it's his group, so he can call it what he wants. Uh-huh. Um, so you, you throw out questions. You know, it's an online forum. But when, when it was in Google+, Plus, there's about 1,500 of us. You throw out a question, anybody throw out a question, and you had the best LinkedIn thought leaders. Helping you answer it. Yeah, just sharing their stuff. Why wouldn't you want to share ideas with, with your peers? The government market is, is a relatively limited gene pool. Biggest market in the world, but it, it's pretty easy to identify the top players in each mm-hmm. of the niches, the proposal people, you know, the BD people, and the marketing people. So uh, when, when Lou Ann put together Government Marketing University and asked me to be on the faculty, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer uh, for me to say, you know, where, where do I sign? Um, and then Mark to ask himself, why the hell didn't I do this 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you're bringing together at least once a year, three, four hundred people together who are the marketing brains behind the major companies in the market. Mm-hmm. This is pretty damn cool. Mm-hmm. And what's cooler is when you're known by most of them, it's it's pretty damn neat. Yes. Well, well done. It's. Uh, I guess it's uh, at one point you realize that people taking your ideas is what they call thought leadership. Yeah, you know... If nobody adopts them, you're not leading. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, you've probably seen this. I've seen it. I've seen parts of my book show up in other people's work. Mm-hmm. You know, literally lifted and transposed. Um, going, yeah, do I want to involve my lawyer in this, or do I just mm-hmm. want to say, you're a buttwinkle? <laughs> That's a technical term. <laughs> So, but, but these are people I don't invite to my little, you know, right. brain clutches. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a, a low life about it, you know, borrow without attribution, I, I really don't need you around. Right, right. 
well said. So. Well said. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. Obviously, folks that are listening, they can find you on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, probably I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but is there any other place that uh, folks, if they wanted to reach out and talk to you, where should they go? Uh, they can go to federaldirect.net. But really, the easiest place to reach me is, is LinkedIn because my contact information is throughout my profile. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. And if you want to listen to one of the really great podcasts, this is the one. Am Tower Off Center, right? Yep. Thank you. That's how they can find it. Uh, yeah, Am Tower Off Center on iTunes or Podcast One or on federalnewsnetwork.com. So thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Mark. you. I appreciate it. All right, and that was our interview with Mark Am Tower of Federal News Radio. And um, I thought, again, his story was really interesting. It's a it's a glimpse into the. Um, kind of the island here around the D.C. metro area of, of marketing specifically to the federal government, obviously being around Washington, D.C. Yeah, and again, uh, as you heard in this interview, you know, Mark has uh, developed a reputation as being a, a LinkedIn advisor to uh, government contractors of all sizes. So uh, if you're interested in uh, developing your reputation, becoming known more as a thought leader, subject matter expert uh, beyond your organization. Um, there are some uh, definite key steps that you need to follow uh, in that process, and we can help you out with that. We actually have a visible expert program that we offer online at Hinge University. And uh, John, where can they get more information on that? Yeah, if you want to learn more about becoming a visible expert, check out hingeuniversity.com. And there's a bunch of free resources there for you to take advantage of. And uh, we all also have a visible expert course that takes you through step by step what you need to do to build your personal brand and create visibility in the professional services world. So, and uh, as always, thank you for joining us today on the Visible Expert Podcast. Uh, please rate, review, and subscribe. Um, to do that, just go to your iTunes podcast app on your phone and search for the visible expert podcast and you can rate and leave a review there that's really helpful and also tell your friends uh, podcasting is a really tight-knit social community so um, make sure that you tell your friends about the visible expert podcast and uh, we look forward to having you on the next episode happy branding